And yet we've lost the things that used to ground us. Faith, patriotism, hard work, family. These things are gone. And so we're lost in the wilderness. I think that we have a void in our country. Vivek Ramaswamy sends shockwaves through the political landscape with a monumental announcement, highlighting a void within the nation. Despite having the least political accountability through unelected bureaucrats who have no backstop of actually being accountable to the public. What's happened in the last century, and it did begin with Woodrow Wilson, the godfather of the modern administrative state, perpetuated by FDR, further exacerbated then by presidents and leaders of both political parties, is that we saw a gradual waterfall of political responsibility in this country, moving away from Congress and the Senate and the US presidency towards three-letter government agencies that wield the most political power in the federal government. Against the backdrop of the reality that we face, which is we are driving Russia further into China's arms as we arm further strengthening what I see as the single greatest military threat that the United States certainly has faced since World War II. You could make a case that the United States has ever faced if you actually look at where this could be going. As the first millennial Republican presidential candidate, Ramaswamy emerges as a transformative figure in American politics. I'm the first millennial ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. And I see people my age in particular across this country who are not doing well because we're starved for purpose and meaning. But in order to actually get this job done, we're going to have to confront several myths that have been perpetuated in this town by advisors and members of the very bureaucracy we're looking to shut down that we're going to have to confront and overcome to understand how the U.S. president can actually get this job done. Ramaswamy underscores the urgency for elected officials to take charge of public policy and governance in the country. If we recognize that we're actually exercising faith, but the most dangerous religions of all are those that claim to be secular, but are actually religious in their conviction. And one of the ways you can smoke out that it's religion is just these inherent tensions that L then you give it a flag, then you give it a symbology, you give it an idol. The first idol was not good enough, the rainbow flag, then they had to make the flag, the upgraded version, the golden idol, they started with the silver one. The people are looking to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And then we latch on to whatever the other side serves up for us. You know, we could wokeism, climatism, whatever it is. With clarity and conviction, Ramaswamy outlines three bold plans aimed at reshaping the nation's trajectory if elected to office. I often think about the standard we should measure how well we're doing as a country is how Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, John Adams, how would they feel? if they were walking around Washington, D.C. today. And these are men, by the way, who deeply disagreed with a lot of, lot of questions relating to the founding of our republic. But they agreed on one thing, that at the very least, the lawmakers and policymakers we elected should actually be the ones making public policy in this country. So against that backdrop, today I'm here to announce how we will revive the promise of that constitutional republic with three branches of government rather than four. That is the purpose of our meeting today. And we're going to get into a level of detail that is, to this point in the last half century, unprecedented, which I believe will spawn nothing short of not incremental reform, but a revolution, a revival of the ideals of the American Revolution in how we actually restore that constitutional republic. One of the things that I feel for some of the people who subscribe to this religion. I somewhat felt for this woman, right? She wasn't, you know, she, there are others like her. There's another one actually at the Iowa State Fair who had similar beliefs that did not comport him or her or they self, whatever this individual was in the same civil manner that this woman did. Reflecting on the past, Ramaswamy acknowledges the strides made by Donald Trump in challenging conventional norms and policies. First, it will be a plan that reduces the size of the federal employee headcount by over 75% if I'm the next president by the end of my first term. 
50% of which is implementable by the end of year one. Second, rescinding a majority, that is to say over 50% of federal regulations which fail the major questions doctrine at issue in West Virginia versus EPA, likely the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime, decided last year. And third, the president's power to use executive authority to shut down redundant federal agencies and to reorganize the federal government accordingly. That's what we're going to talk about today. Thank you. Now, before I get into those, the details of the first five agencies we will shut down and the basis for rescinding a broad swath of federal regulations, it's first and most importantly worth understanding why it hasn't happened yet. This vision is not an original vision. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that. Good presidents, excellent presidents, from Reagan to Trump, have spoken to the same ideal. And I give credit to Donald Trump for taking more steps than have been taken in a generation in the direction with the Schedule F exceptions that they began late in the term, aided by many people in this room. That was a step forward. One of the suppositions in the rights movement, which, you know, I'm totally open to this, but it's just partly of how we created rights in this country is that the sense of the person you're attracted to is hardwired on the day you're born even though there is no gay gene. That's the, now if you make it one movement, the movement, that's the same movement that also now says that your own is completely fluid over the course of your life, even though there is a definitive chromosome. Ramaswamy delves into the existential void plaguing society, cautioning against the rise of secular ideologies to fill the spiritual vacuum. These are symptoms, addiction, depression, you name it. These are symptoms of a deeper void of purpose and meaning in our country. But Tucker, I think the good news in that is I think our country's not doing well, but I think that this is also our opportunity as a movement to level up and fill that void, that vacuum with our own vision. Individual, family, nation, God. When I talk to young people about this, they're more interested in that than they are in race, gender, and climate. And so now we got to start running to something as Americans. And if we do, I'm confident that our country will be doing well again. That's where I'm at. Is it my imagination or are people who weren't raised in traditional religious households, who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about theology, all of a sudden talking about God a lot? Do you notice that? I do notice that, actually. And I think this is a good sign because... You know, there's an old expression, right? If there's a hole the size of God in your heart and God does not fill it, something else will instead. That's what's happened in the last decade in our country. Something else, some secular religion has filled that void. But it hasn't really satisfied our moral hunger, right? And so that's kind of, that effect is fading. And I think people are hungry to turn back to the real thing. The conversation's coming up, but they say it with a kind of prudishness. Yes. Right? right? God is a four-letter word. It's sort of a thing you have to tiptoe around. And I think that right now, family's the same way. The family makes some people uncomfortable when I say it, but actually this is the best known form of governance to mankind. Emphasizing the importance of leadership appointments, Ramaswamy advocates for qualified agency heads committed to serving the American people. We have no discernible national interest at issue in the truth is that as much as we will fetishize and debate the 1994 budapest memorandum which the u.s wrote you know uk and russia were also parties to it with which i believe we have more than fulfilled our obligations you don't hear a peep about james baker's 1990 commitment his not one inch commitment yes. to the nato wouldn't expand one inch beyond germany no discussion of that ramaswamy challenges the notion of accountability asserting that true authority stems from the ability to hire and fire subordinates. Now, I believe in getting into detail. This is an occasion to dive deeper into that detail. Under the current rules, the rules governing how those employees are fired in large mass scale layoffs are governed by the Office of Personnel Management and the OPM rules. The current OPM rules give that responsibility to agency heads. 
That is a fact. Well, I think that raises the importance of making sure the next U.S. president appoints agency heads in those roles who are prepared. I think it should be a litmus test for anybody who serves in a cabinet level position, a litmus test that that agency head is prepared to carry out mass layoff, large reductions in force as laid out in the statute. However, if such agency head is even as unprepared to act after on the job, recall the first point that I mentioned. The U.S. president has sole authority to set the rules governing the Office of Personnel Management, which does absolutely give the duly elected president of the United States the power to single-handedly execute those large-scale layoffs and mass reductions in force. This completely subverts the traditional wisdom fed to U.S. presidents from Reagan to Trump over the last 40 years, but will be a necessary toolkit that says that the CEO, the leader of the executive branch, does indeed have the authority to decide who is and is not hired in the executive branch. And I'll tell you this, speaking as a CEO, if somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. It means you work for them because you're responsible for what they do without any authority to actually change it. But the beauty of this is that our law tracks this directly if we're willing to actually read the law in totality. In a rallying call to define American identity, Ramaswamy underscores the pivotal role of the next president in shaping the nation's ethos. He had a cowbell and was ringing and was, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, empathetical to having conversation. This woman at least having a conversation, I kind of felt for her because what I saw in her eyes for sure. was she is not, she's not an evil person who's trying to see be a crusader for some faith to put the other side out of business. Those people exist. She was just lost, actually. I, I don't know if it was harder to see on the, on the camera, but I was face to face with her. And, I, and I, it's, when I see that, it's why I also thanked her. I said, thank you for being civil in your exchange. And I'll give you the same courtesy in return. I mean, she, she was like early 20s, best my guess. She's lost. There's a void there. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it's, so, so I asked her the question back. There's a blank stare you get in a response. It's almost the same blank stare as if I get asked most young people on a given day, what does it mean to be American? It's that same blank stare. That's the void. It's like a deer in the headlights. And I think that this is our moment, our duty, our job as leaders. It's the job of the next U.S. president. It might be the most important one of all. To fill that void with an answer to the question of what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be you? What does it mean to be an individual rather than riding a tectonic plate of group identity? What does it mean to be a member of a family, a family with a mother and a father that by definition brought you into this world? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a citizen of this nation? Not some nebulous, vague global citizen fighting climate change. No, 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 but a citizen of this nation on this land with these ideals. What does it mean to believe in God, to be a nation under God? Despite his relative youth and political inexperience, Ramaswamy's candidacy resonates with a new generation of voters, signaling a potential shift in the political landscape. And so if we start talking more about, hey, that's what we're running to. That's actually what we stand for. Yes, we are one nation. I'm a citizen of this nation, not some nebulous global citizen somewhere else, that it is one nation under God. Yes, it is a nation that is stronger when we ground ourselves in the unit of the family. Then I notice something happens, especially for younger people across the country, Tucker, is they're more open to that message than they thought, but they need someone to serve it up to them. And I think as a I'm, I'm the first non-politician, but I'm also a younger person in this race. I don't have a ton of experience running governments before, but I think in reaching younger people, that's something I feel called to do in this race. And it's why we're traveling college campuses across this country. And I am optimistic about what I see. I think there is no basis for us to send our young men and women, our sons and daughters, people my age or any age, to go defend somebody else's border halfway around the world when we should be using our own military to secure our own border in this country. And I will not apologize for that. We have to put the interests of this country first. And one of the things that does frustrate me, Tucker, is that this is one issue where I, I so love many of the other people who are running for this nomination for president. I think most of us 
and the entire field I speak for are in this for the right reasons. We are people who care about our country and want to deliver our country to a better place.